Live from the JSA Podcast Studio, presenting Data Movers, showcasing the leaders behind the headlines in the telecom and data center infrastructure industry. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Data Movers, our fabulous podcast series. I'm your host, Jamie Spadokataya, CEO and founder of JSA, along with my amazing co-host, Mr. Evan Christel, top B2B social media influencer. Hey, Evan. Hey, Jamie. How are you? Really good. Really good. It's an exciting good, good. Uh, mid-September time, huh? It is, it is. And the data movers, it's always exciting because we sit down with the most influential men and women of today's leading telco and data center world, supporting the network infrastructure requirements of this new normal. So Jamie, September, you know what time that is? Uh, I certainly do. My Apple Watch tells me so. <laughs> it's time for California streaming by Apple. Yeah, yeah. So do you have your credit card ready? Because this is going to oh. be a pretty big event. Apple Pay, you know it. <laughs> so we're going to get new iPhones, obviously, uh, all kinds of cool specs. And I'm most excited about the new MacBook Airs and Pros with the new M1 chip. That, that's going to be super exciting. You're, you're all in on Apple, right? I, I mean, my everything, everything. My watch, my, my phone, my, my computer. Um, yeah, iPad and, you know. Typical for, Californian, typical yeah. Californian. But this is going to be a big one. We might see glasses. We saw Facebook launch their new video glasses today. Uh, and we're going to see a new Apple Watch, maybe with like a blood pressure monitor or other sensing. So interesting times. And we have a good guess because something needs to power all of this amazing technology, right? That's right. That's right. Let's get right to it. Um, we have... Uh, one of the, the true innovators uh, in our data center industry. Today, we welcome Wes Swenson, CEO of Nova Data Centers. Hey, everybody. Welcome, Wes. So I was doing a little bit of research before this podcast, which is unusual. Usually, I don't do any research. But uh, in this case, you know, looking at your bio, it's kind of unbelievable. I, I see Philips here. I see WordPerfect, Novell for you old folks like myself, SonicWall, BlackRock. Will Tech, HireVue, I, I mean, MSTAR, Canopy Ventures, on and on and on. Tell us about this amazing journey through the world of technology and how you got started with Nova. Well, it's a long story, but I'll keep it short. But basically, right out of high school, I've always had uh, just a great affinity for tech, gadgets. Just in general, I love tech. And Right out of high school, while going to college, I was working at NV Phillips uh, in semiconductor manufacturing. And, and this is long before it moved overseas. This is in the really old days when it was done here in, in the United States. And, you know, that, that in itself was really kind of the beginning for me that it created a foundation in uh, manufacturing. Kanban's just-in-time manufacturing, quality control, statistical process control. And I use all of those things today to build data centers. And through that, you know, I then joined WordPerfect, which is, you know, very old school word processing, you know, desktop software that was acquired by Novell. And I went from WordPerfect into sales operations at Novell then uh, jumped over with a friend of mine, Ron Hines, over to Phobos and SonicWall, then over to Forum Systems, where I was the CEO there. Uh, that was sold, went to Signal Peak and Canopy Ventures as an entrepreneur in residence. And at that time, I uh, was looking at three or four companies. And I've been through all of these software, desktop software, rack mounted appliances. I'd always sold. Uh, software or equipment to data centers that never actually ran a data center. And Signal Peak had a company called Center 7 that was kind of a quasi managed service provider with some data center space. And uh, I just had a really big affinity for it. And, and I have a pretty good aptitude for different markets. And I just loved the tangibility of data centers. And to be honest, I was pretty burnt out from enterprise software 
and security software. And not that I'm a cabinet maker or a craftsman, but data centers for me are that kind of physical side of technology. And I just love it. And I've been in the space for now over 15 years since then. And so that's a little bit of my background, pretty versatile. I've been through venture capital firms and I've been on both sides of it. So I have a pretty good idea of what investors need, clients need. And, and I'm always on the innovation side. I did not come from the real estate industry. So I'm not jaded. I, I don't really, uh, I don't fear innovation. I actually embrace it and I like change. And I feel like this industry is actually really ripe for disruption. Absolutely. And boy, you know, disruption, innovation, change, uh, definitely words I would use to describe your, your Nova's flagship data center that you are currently building. That's uh, in West Jordan, I believe, in Utah, near Salt Lake. Um, I'm hearing some pretty cutting edge features are going into this beautiful campus. Everything from design, drone and robo dog facility monitoring, just, you know, unbelievable technology. Can you tell us a little bit more? I can, yeah. So this is in partnership with CIM Group, who are my main investors out of Los Angeles. They've really given me kind of a clean palette to paint from. And this is something I've been building up to for 15 years to really design Wes's vision of what a future data center looks like, something that would have a 20 to 30 year life to it that could be built in 2021 and still just as relevant in 20 or 30 years. So it's done in, in a way that will anticipate or adapt to the future as much as possible. So I have the typical cornerstones of power, connectivity, but then we've taken some things to a new level. Uh, it is on a 100 acre campus. Uh, we plan 1.5 million square feet. So it'll be the largest by far in Utah. And it's really designed as a data center campus versus just an individual building. And we've really anticipated, you know, the future growth of compute. And I should probably say my view of the market is, you know, when I got into data centers 15 years ago, I kind of felt like it was in a toddler stage. I mean, today the internet's about 30 years old as we know it. So it was, it was about half as old when I got into the, this space. And I felt like it was in a toddler space. But today I consider it still quite infant. And I know that sounds crazy for what we do, but I think just like Evan was mentioning, the, the glasses, uh, Watch 7, anything like that, just the number of apps and the interconnectivity. I just ordered a bird feeder the other day that has a camera and sound detection. And it'll take a picture of the bird, identify the bird, play the sound back to you, right? I mean, those kinds of things, they, they weren't around 15 years ago. So you just think of where compute is going to go and it can only go up. We're going to store that data. We're never, I don't know the last time I deleted a, a big bucket full of emails. It's just, I just don't do it. I just keep everything. And that just creates more demand for data centers. Plus we have latency issues. We, we will have more autonomous driving. I mean, I could go on and on, but I just think the amount of compute that we're going to do over the next 30 years is gonna make the first 30 years look really dwarfed and very small. So in that, we've anticipated this large campus and this is really a clean slate to do something very purpose-built. It's not a conversion of another site. This was a uh, hundred acres of previous farmland that we have taken over. Purpose-built, what do I mean by that? So the, we have an 80,000 foot corporate, uh, square foot headquarters that is, I would consider class A plus. Uh, it is, it's a work of art, quite honestly. It looks like a symphony hall. Again, my vision, I wanted a Asian Scandinavian minimalism in the design. It has floating roofs. It has tons of amenities like uh, a gym, which will have a couple of F1 simulation racers, golf simulators, a lot of amenities at this site because the clients and ourselves are there. 
But the data center itself, such as the walls. So in Utah, we're in a cold high altitude desert. The walls I built 14 inches thick, eight inches of concrete, four inches of foam, and two more inches of concrete, trying to create a high insulating value so that I can control the climate within the data center. It's not unusual for us to go up or down 30 degrees, you know, in a few hours in Utah. So, you know, things like that, um, we're doing five foot raised floor. People ask why do raised floor versus slab on grade? Well, you can, if you're doing raised floor, you either need to trench the concrete or you need to build, you know, something to support it from above. In this case, where we're a multi-tenant data center, we have to kind of build for the most often average use cases. And this gives us more flexibility. We really focus on a design that allows us to provision power to a client in two to three days versus two to three months or two to three weeks. So this allows us to keep a really clean design. Um, we're doing Aquatherm, which is a polypropylene uh, product to, to run our water cooling system where most people do steel. Um, that has a 30 year life, just things like that, that um, th I would just say this data center has zero compromises in design. Uh, and it is really, it is built for high density, low density. We can do N, N plus one, two N. We have a really flexible electrical architecture. We have a substation on site that can go up to 180 to 200 megawatts. And that even that is pre-planned and an intelligently designed where it's internal to the campus. You can't actually get to that substation from any outside area. You have to, it's within the campus. There, there are teenagers that are notorious in parts of the country as shooting those transformers out and just things like that. We take a lot of precaution in that. And um, those robo dogs keeping those teens away, I bet. <laughs> yeah, so robo dogs. Yeah, so a couple of things that we, we have kind of ventured in is uh, robotics and drones. So this is a hundred acre campus, completely fenced. The robo dog from Boston Dynamics has been in partnership with BYU University Engineering Department. We've been programming that dog to run missions within the data center. So it is programmed to walk around, recharge on its own. It's equipped with cameras, uh, uh, hot and cold de detection, LIDAR, FLUR. So it will rock, walk around the data center and monitor the equipment for us and check in. It can also watch analysis from uh, one keypad to another. It's also been equipped with uh, voice enablement where it actually goes back to the database. And if it recognizes a person, it checks with the database that that person or employee should be in the data center and it will actually say their name. It'll say good morning or hello. It's, we did that to make it slightly less dystopian. When this dog is walking around, uh, it can be quite shocking. Eventually, uh, as Boston Dynamics upgrades that dog, we will add arms to those dogs and they'll be able to open data centers for each other, the doors and scan badges to go in and out of doors. So that's a, that's a really cutting edge thing that we're trying. Um, we also have an autonomous drone that sits in a weatherized container in a, in a very secure area on the campus. And it automatically launches on missions and does perimeter security. It's also equipped with floor. So it uh, will monitor the data center for hot and cold spots, water leaks. Um, it can detect people. Today, uh, you can also, you'll see it with uh, fence vibration. If we get any vibration on a fence, on the sensor that's greater than the wind velocity, the drone automatically takes off, goes and investigates it. You know, it can do infrared. Uh, it's really, really something. And it just comes back, this uh, vestibule opens, it lands and it recharges through its feet. So it's, it's really stuff like that I couldn't have done 10 years ago, but it's a lot more approachable today. So those are just a few things that we're doing. Wow, amazing. Sounds like a, a tech geek's nirvana between the leading edge data center tech, the drones, the 
robo dogs, uh, you know, the clean air, skiing in, in Utah, man, it sounds <laughs> fabulous. So one of my favorite uh, futurists, Daniel Burris, talks about anticipatory leadership or skating to where the puck is going to be, not, not where it is. Uh, can you elaborate on the kind of industry trends that you have seen that, that you're looking to leverage to kind of shape uh, your plan to build out your position as, as a leader at Nova's data center? Yeah, I, a couple of things. I mean, so in Utah, you know, because this is a high cold desert, so we're known for our powder snow. And that's because as the storms come across, right, they, the humidity drops over the range. When that snow drops, it's low humidity snow. Those same geologic, geographical aspects here play into how we have always approached data centers. So at Nova, we practice waterless cooling design. So we do not use any evaporative or water chilling systems to cool our data center. So it's all done through ambient air. You know, you were just talking about it. This nice, cool, cold air. We use that to cool our data centers. On days that it's too hot, we have a refrigerant system and a closed loop system that does not have any evaporation. So, you know, we are really big about sustainability. Uh, it, 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 I would say it's one of our foremost issues. So waterless cooling design and also renewable energy. So all of our data centers will be on 100% renewable. We are trying to reduce our impact to the environment. So, you know, I can't stress that enough that if, if, if what I believe is true on the amount of compute and how it will grow, data centers will continue to be resource intensive. Whatever we can do to offset that even, uh, even our data center, when it was built with tilt-up concrete, we made sure that was coming from local vendors to keep our carbon footprint down versus precast. Things like that we're really conscious of. We try to use as many local uh, providers as well as U.S. manufacturers. The raised floor is U.S. manufactured. Again, it's reduce that footprint as much as possible from an environmental impact. So we do, we have anticipated that for years that our, it's not just droughts and water shortages, but when you do water design, it's also the wastewater that you put off from the facility that has to be handled. And, you know, we would just rather avoid that. We would rather go through a bit more tech, maybe a little bit more expense on the front end to reduce any environmental impact. I, I'm in awe. I you know, I've, I was just on another podcast, uh, Data Center Hawk, and we were talking about what is the future of data centers. And uh, truly, I, I listed you. I said, you know, there, we need to use technology to uh, help reduce our carbon footprint. Uh, you know, um, I'm a big, uh, big fan of what you're doing here. It's so critical. Um, and, and I also love that you're committed to uh, U.S. manufacturing as well, you know, um, you know, and it, it, it just feels like it's, it's such an important part of your DNA, um, your, your commitment to Utah, your commitment to Western, uh, us, you know, and talk about that and, and, and also to, to America in general. Yeah, thank you. I mean, so in the West, we feel like there's still a real window of opportunity out here because we don't have the populous centers that they do in the East or Southeast. I guess my vision for it, and Evan touched on it, anticipating. So if, if compute grows like I think it will, how do we anticipate that? Well, my belief is that there will be some applications that require really low latency, right? So if it takes 300 milliseconds to blink and we can move data at 10 to 20 milliseconds anywhere in the US, there will be applications that require it at even you know, one to five millisecond speeds. So latency plays into it. But beyond just latency, if the amount of compute grows, people will be chasing lower total cost of operations in general. It will become a competitive advantage for most enterprises to reduce their cost of compute. If, if it grows exponentially, you've got to reduce that cost. The costs in the West 
in general are lower, but the challenges in the West, like in Utah, Nevada, other places is we have regulated utilities. We have a scarce resource in land. You'd think there's a lot of land, but around fiber intersections, it's not as plentiful as we think. In Salt Lake Valley, you know, we live in a bowl, right? Uh, the Wasatch Bowl. And so land is kind of limited by the mountains here. So in some areas of the West, land is also scarce, but we think companies are gonna have to chase lower total cost of operations over time. They're gonna be less sensitive about, or what I should say is the old server huggers will become less sensitive about where the compute is located versus what it costs and its resiliency to, to disasters, sustainability. I think it will become a more holistic buy rather than the early uh, evolution of data centers, which were really concentrated around large metro areas with population. It was the, the path of least resistance, but with the amount of compute growing, I just, I think that's like the popularity of Phoenix, Hillsboro, Las Vegas, Salt Lake. And I consider the top seven markets in the West to be Salt Lake, Las Vegas, Denver, Phoenix, Hillsboro, LA and San Francisco or the Bay Area, I consider those to be the top seven Western markets, markets, and those are all really big targets for us for expansion. Awesome. Well, Utah is a great state. Lots of reasons why people are moving there from around the country and California and, and packing up and moving to Utah, just a gorgeous place to live. So what, what are your, some of your favorite things to do around the state in your spare time, free time? Well, I, I love to travel, but, you know, the nice part about Salt Lake is we're about uh, maybe five and a half hours to Las Vegas, about four and a half hours to Yellowstone. Uh, just the other day, I took my kids up to do some fossil digging up in Kemmerer, Wyoming, a couple hour drive. Oh, wow. Did you find anything? I did. Lots of, uh, it's about a 50 million year old uh, fossil bed and lots of fish, lots of fish cool. and, and turtle poop. Turtle poop, kind of cool. but but I really, I mean, I love the outdoors. I think uh, that is really kind of the, I would say, the key aspect of living in Utah is outdoor recreation. Uh, you can go skiing, hiking, boating. Uh, you know, ATVs. You can go to the Red Rock Desert in a few hours down the Moab. I mean, we boast uh, five national parks in the state. Right. Uh, Bryce, Zions, Arches, you name it. It is just, I would say that's right. To live here, that's kind of a cornerstone uh, of living here, but I'm just a huge outdoors enthusiast. So you name it, I'll try it. But my big focus is generally cycling and that would be mountain biking, fat biking in the winter or road cycling. So those are, that's my big passion. Uh, gosh, I, I love, I just love talking to you, Wes. I just, you always open my, nah, my mind. Nah. Uh, so this this actual, this section that we're getting to our rapid fire section is gonna be fun, I, I'm sure. Uh, here, we're just going to uh, pound you with a couple of fast questions and just say the first thing that comes to mind. So- I'll Do my best, do my best. <laughs> here we go. Um, favorite food that would surprise us? Uh, black licorice ice cream. That is a good one. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds disgusting, I must say, but okay, we'll, we'll let you have your, your, uh, I love, I love black licorice ice cream, ice cream. It's very hard to find, but I love it. I can't imagine why it's hard to find. It's, it's so, so, so one word that people would use to describe you. Uh, you know, I am a pretty laid back guy, but I think a lot of people think I'm intense. So <laughs> I would say innovative. That's innovative, yeah, innovative for uh, and determined, I would say, is probably another uh, probably good descriptor. All good words. All <laughs> right, so Apple or Android? Apple all the way. I'm full Apple. There's this is no like an escaping. Apple commercial today. <laughs> There's no escaping my Apple. Uh, yeah. yeah, next week is <laughs> going to be an expensive uh, week for you. It so um, looking at the first uh, uh, page on your iPhone, What's the app you use the most? Oh, I would say probably Instagram, but I have, uh, other than, you know, the typical stuff, email and stuff, but I, I'm a huge uh, design 
nerd. So I follow a lot of architectural uh, design forums, uh, you know, from Minotti in Italy to architecture in Colorado. I'm, I'm a huge design fanatic and an art fanatic. Um, you know, so I love modern art, classical art. Um, so I'm a huge museum buff. So that's, that's my big, my probably my guilty pleasure and what I use the most beyond the typical business apps. I noticed that I was looking at pictures of your new facility and it's beautiful. I mean, from the, uh, obviously the data center side is cool, but just the, the building and the, the workspaces and the, uh, it's just amazing to, to see. So I'd encourage folks to go check it out. Yeah. I think so. It's really tasteful, but it's very modern and with a lot of just textures, black marble, book match marble, wood. I mean, it is really, it's done to, I guess, my vision. And love it. I, I want the complete experience for my clients. It sounds like Jamie's house, but also very tasteful when I've seen her. I think you're right. <laughs> well, thanks so much. I want Wes to come over and do some decoration here. I don't know. About, I don't, I'm not saying I'm good at it, but I, I know what I like. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks so much for joining us, Wes. It was really intriguing to hear about your blending of data center technology with advanced emerging tech like drones and and uh, sustainable tech and and sensors and and robot dogs. I mean, this is really something to see. So can't wait to uh, follow all your progress. Right, thank you, I appreciate it. Set, really setting data center campus construction up to become an art form. So um, we are uh, so excited, can't wait for the open house. Thank you so much, Wes, we appreciate you. And viewers, listeners, uh, if you enjoyed today's Data Movers podcast as much as I did, be sure to check out jsa.net slash podcasts for our upcoming Data Movers episodes. Every Wednesday morning, we drop another podcast. Uh, and, 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 and give us some ratings and reviews. We, yeah. we, we would love that. So we need a few, a few more ratings and reviews. And then follow us on Twitter at jscotto and Evan Kerstell. And as always, guys, stay safe and happy networking. Awesome. Thank you.